My name is Billy Weitzer. I'm the executive director of the Leo Beck Institute. And on behalf of the Leo Beck Institute, Jewish Museum Frankfurt and the Carnegie Hall Festival Voices of Hope, I uh, welcome you to our program on Samp Samson Shamus, Shamus and the Art of Exile. Uh, given that we are virtual and you're not sitting in our center, I will describe that we are located at the Center for Jewish History in Manhattan, where we fulfill our mission to preserve and promote the history and culture of German speaking Jewry. Our collections include millions of documents, um, over 80,000 books and more than 4,000 works of art, many of which are in our Griffin, Griffinger art catalog. And um, we're gonna post the, um, the link to that catalog in chat. Um, today's program demonstrates how we use art to present history, but also to explore the contemporary relevance of the past. Samson Shamus was brought to our attention by LBI board member, Charlie Scheidt, whose parents had a long friendship with Shamus. Charlie also knew Shamus and his widow, and Charlie has donated some of Shamus's works to LBI. I also wanna note that one of our partners at the center, the Yeshiva University Museum, holds many of the Shamus mosaics that you will see shortly. We are very interested in adding to our knowledge about Shamus and what individuals or institutions have his work. So if you do have information about his works or about him personally or his family, please contact us. And now in the chat, uh, you'll see contact information for me. What we're gonna begin with, begin with is a brief five minute video that introduces Shamus. It was produced by Charlie Scheidt, who I mentioned, and filmed by Kat Roher. Um, a year or two ago as we began our exploration. So we're gonna to cut to the video and uh, we will be back in five minutes. on creating from the detritus of the blitz all the pieces of glass and cement and wire uh, caused by the bombing during the blitz and he insisted on continuing to use even that as evidence of the continuation and the persistence of the human spirit. I think Shamus was um, motivated, of course, by the need to use art material, and that's what he found. He found uh, broken material, broken objects, um, odds and ends. The very idea of using shards to express a broken world, I think, is, is just very novel. There was no paint available, there was no canvas available, none of the materials that a painter would normally use, none of those materials were available. But the necessity to create from the rubble of the Blitz was what inspired him and, and what drove him to create these works. The subjects of these are very sad, gruesome, execution, sacrifice, unknown victim, return to the fatherland where there are three figures who are obviously the walking wounded or the walking missing legs. 
it's very moving and very sad. It is very obvious that uh, Shamus was very much overcome by the by the grief of of the uh, his war experience. I don't think they were meant as self portraits. They were cries of anger, cries of grief, as he suffered through the Blitz and as he had watched what happened to the country in which he had grown up and which chased him and eventually killed his sister and his mother. The subsequent generations after the war, and when I think about this, I think about actually the third generation and the upcoming fourth, are getting further and further from the tactile relationship to this period. And when you see an artist like Shamas who worked in the materials of war and worked through the trauma of war in his varying mediums, it's a way of accessing the insanity of the period, the devastation of the period, and really, it. It screams, a lot of it screams at you. I mean, especially when you're looking at the material used from blitz bombings being, you know, created into visceral figures. He's really one of the forerunners of uh, detritus art, but uh, trying to make something out of nothing is certainly, um, an idea today, and I think he is a bit of a forerunner. We should really try to remember who came before us. He came of age artistically in the 20s and 30s, and then he had to go, and then he had to leave. And uh, many artists uh, really had to give up their profession even. And he was uh, able to sustain his artwork and his creative practice. What I recognize in his art is tremendous vibrancy, a will to live, an imagination, and a, an insistence on keeping going. Um, for those of you who just joined us, that was a brief video that introduced Samson Shamus, and now we're going to move to the main part of our program. Again, I'm Billy Weitzer, the executive director of the Leo Beck Institute in New York and Berlin. And um, the order of the day is we'll hear from our two panelists. Uh, we, the three of us will then engage in some conversation and then we will uh, take questions from the audience. You can put those questions in at any time using the Q&A button uh, at the bottom of your screen. So please, um, feel welcome to ask us questions and make other observations about uh, what we're presenting today. Um, our two panelists, um, first we have Dr. Miriam Bistrovich who uh, became the Berlin representative of the Leo Beck Institute in New York, Berlin when we opened an office there in 2013. Um, before earning her PhD in history, Dr. Bistrovich majored in modern history and art history, which makes her uniquely qualified to participate here. Her current research fields are Jewish exile, uh, in particular in East Asia, um, and uh, diaspora cultures of remembrance and anti-Semitism. Annika Friedman has been part of the team at the Jewish Museum Frankfurt since earlier this year. Her major assignment is to do research on Samson Shamus in preparation for an exhibition about Shamus at the Jewish Museum Frankfurt that will be mounted in late 2022. Annika received her master's in Holocaust studies at the University of Haifa in Israel, her bachelor's degree at the University of British Columbia in Canada. And during her studies, she was an assistant curator of an art exhibition, Arrivals, Departures, which told the story of 18 Jewish artists who lived and worked in Paris before and during the Nazi, Nazi occupation of France. Um, I look forward to engaging in conversation with both uh, Miriam and Annika, but first you will hear brief presentations by each. Okay. Miriam. Yeah. I'm just figuring out if the technical 
to work in. Okay. The presentation didn't start, so sorry about that. So um, thank you very much for welcoming me and also for the chance to participate in this wonderful talk about Samson Chamis, who was really for many, many years almost forgotten in Germany. Since Annika Friedman will be telling you all a lot about Samson Chamis in particular, I was just hoping to provide you with some kind of historical backdrop to show and explain to you what he and his fellow artists suffered and also experienced during their time in Germany and also in exile. Let me start with a brief chronology of Nazi persecution. Even almost immediately after the Nazi rise to power, they started with the law of restoration of professional civil service, thus banning everybody who was either in a political opposition or racially defined as Jewish from civil service. These included a lot of art professors and also many, many different positions that were usually regarded as quite interesting and used by the Jews. In the Nuremberg laws in 1935, they finally defined what they considered a Jew, meaning those who were at least had one parent who was Jewish or considered Jewish under Nazi law. 1938, a year that we will hear a lot about in the upcoming few minutes, was crucial for the whole situation. It was a time of the Anschluss and the Kristallnacht and the number of refugees searched afterwards. In October 1941, the mass deportations started. And in March 1942, the extermination camps were put in service. So since we are talking about artists in exile, we should also focus on the specifics that have to do with artists going into exile and why they are doing it. The reason for going into exile is quite varied and it was whenever we are talking about individuals, but it is usually linked quite closely to the lack of freedom, the violation of human rights, oppression or persecution by state power. And why artists are usually targeted is quite simply explained since art reflects and deals critically with the society in which it is being produced, be it the political powers or the social life. Thus, under authoritarian regimes, artists and their work are among the first targets who are persecuted and experience state repression. During the Nazi regime, Jewish artists like Shamas suffered from a double discrimination, first of all, as being labeled as Jews, and second, as artists who were not confirming with what the Nazis considered to be high-class art. All in all, during the Nazi regime, around 500,000 people fled from persecution. Among those were 360,000 from Germany, with about 140,000 additional Austrians after the annexation in 1938. 80 to 90 percent of them were targeted as Jews under the Nazi Nuremberg laws. And among all of them, were about approximately 10,000 artists from Germany, Austria, and Czechoslovakia. Those are estimates because you don't usually file in when you are going into exile, whether you're an artist or not. You are just applying in any kind of visa in order to get out. One of the main reasons that Chalmers had to leave was that he was among those who were considered as artists who created degenerate art. The term was coined by the Nazis in order to 
counter everything that could be described as avant-garde art or modern art, like expressionism, fauvism, cubism, dadaism, surrealism. Instead, the Nazis preferred works that were more or less considered romantic realism and were closer to the classical Greek or Roman art. And that quite closely resembled whatever they could consider to be applicable to their blood and soil ideology and also told about their values. Starting in 1933, the first directors of museums were dismissed when they collected modern art or avant-garde art. Their successors usually were either collecting in moderated ways or completely abandoning every avant-garde art that was collected within their museums, thus putting them into storage. In 1937, a book called The Cleansing of the Temples of Art was published and inspired Goebbels to commission the president of the Academy of Fine Arts, Siegler, to do an exhibit on Antarctic Kunst, Degenerate Art, which took place in Munich in 1937. It showed about 600 artworks from 125 artists and was later even highlighted by Hitler in order with the, um, Hitler issued a decree ordering Ziegler to also confiscate from all states of the Third Reich, federal states and municipal and museums, galleries, and collections, the existing works that could be considered as degenerate art. All in all, 100 museums were visited and about 20,000 works of art were confiscated by Ziegler during the next few months. So all of this happened in 1937. Among those artworks were also artworks of Shamas. He wasn't presented in the exhibit, but his artworks were nonetheless confiscated afterwards. In May 1938, almost one year after all of this took place, a law on confiscation of products of degenerate art was decreed, telling, I quote, the products of degenerate art which have been seized in museums in publicly accessible collections before the passing of this law have been identified by authorities appointed by the Führer and Reich Chancellor, and thus can be seized without compensation on behalf of the Reich provided that they were guaranteed to be owned by nationals or domestic legal entities. This decree not only retroactively made it legal to confiscate art, but also made it possible to sell this art. Artworks that were collected like I said, and like you can read 20,000 of them, were shown to art dealers and those who were not deemed worthy to be resold were often destroyed. We know from ledgers that were being filed by the Nazis that Samson Shams art was confiscated and most often destroyed upon arrival. Those artworks that were neither destroyed, returned, or sold were then stored in the Ministry of Propaganda in 1941. And their whereabouts are mostly unknown or less traceable. Just in some cases, we do know what happened to them. There's no record of the destruction caused by the war or later. So, we do know a lot about what happened to those artworks in the exhibit, but what happened to all those other 20,000 is still something that fuels ongoing research. And now I'd like to hear Annika Friedman's elaborations on Samson Chalmers and his work and how it fits into all of this. Thank you, Dr. Bistrovich. Uh, I'd also like to echo your sentiments. Thank you very much uh, to Dr. Weitzer and the Leo Beck Institute for, for having me here tonight. 
uh, sorry, this afternoon in New York, and it's really my pleasure to take part on behalf of the Jewish Museum of Frankfurt. Okay. So Samson Shamus was born on December 31st, 1898, as the second of three children to Sophie and Albert Shamus. The Shamus family is one with incredibly deep roots in Frankfurt, stretching back hundreds of years to the Judengasse, which goes back to the mid 15th century, where it was the largest Jewish community in Germany in early modern times. Shamus received a religious education and also grew up in a predominantly Jewish neighborhood with the local Friedberger synagogue within walking distance. In 1915, at 18 years old, Shamas enrolled in what is today known as the University of Art and Design Offenbach am Main, with which he broke away from family tradition. His father worked at the Rothschild banking house, but I would assume Shamas was in part inspired by his uncle, Ludwig Shamas, who was an art dealer, supporter of the expressionist movement, and champion of the infamous artist Ernst Ludwig Kirchner. The beginning of his art education was brought to a halt as between 1916 and 1918, Shamus was conscripted and served in the German military during the First World War. It was after his release that he was able to continue his artistic journey and enroll in the Kunst- and Gewerbeschule Frankfurt, which translates to the Higher Education for Applied Artistic Training, what is today known as the Städelschule where he studied painting, graphics, and set design. During his studies, Shamus earned his living with commercial graphic work, designed advertisements for cigarettes, gasoline, and car oil. After his graduation in 1923, Shamus worked in theatrical set design. He also worked in textile and tapestry design, where you can see the heavy Bauhaus influence of the mid 1920s, Along with a Bauhaus influence, the example on the left also clearly displays traditional Jewish themes, such as the menorah and the Star of David, which are already appearing in Shamus's work. Another symbol is Shamus's depiction of the Frankfurt Opera House. It was here that Shamus's uncle's gallery was located, so it held a personal collect connection for Shamus as well. But it's also a particularly unique rendering of the scene as he paints out onto the square and not towards the famous opera house itself, which would have been behind him. This particular scene can also be interpreted as one of the last looks Shamus had on his hometown before everything would drastically change. On the right, you can see the Shamus family home, which actually still stands today. In January 1933, when the Nazis rose to power, Shamus held one last solo exhibition in February at the Schumann Gallery, but he most definitely saw the writing on the wall and immediately began to prepare his emigration plans. He traveled multiple times to the Netherlands, which would eventually be his midway stop en route to England. Shamus's escape into exile came shortly after the Kristallnacht of 1938. While he had been setting plans into place for years, I can only imagine that the events of Kristallnacht were inarguably a final contributing factor. In January, 1939, Shamus was legally issued a passport and left Germany. He stayed with a friend in the Netherlands for a few weeks and then continued on to England. After his arrival in England, Shamus actually had the chance to find a bit of his artistic footing and was able to actually able to host a solo exhibit at the Brook Street Gallery in March of 1940, where he displayed the few works he was able to take with him from Frankfurt, including the beautiful opera Opernplatz, the opera square we saw earlier, as well as the new pieces he created in just in the just over a year since he had arrived. In June of 1940, Shamus was interned at the Heighton camp near Liverpool. I think it's extremely important to note that when we speak of a camp, we, we must hesitate to draw direct comparisons to the camps of the same period in Eastern Europe, but this was definitely an internment and a confiscation of free movement and other freedoms. Approximately 5,000 German, Austrian and Italian civilians were detained as they were officially considered enemy aliens and a potential national risk if there were to be a German invasion. Reports described that isolation and sheer boredom tormented most of the internees, but some found solace in painting, composing, and teaching, which earned the camp the nickname the Heighton University. We could say that Shamas was then definitely one of Heighton University's students or even professors, 
Shamus was able to feed his desire to continually create by using the materials that he found around him. Without access to traditional painting materials, Shamus used his food rations, often fashioning paints from beet juice, shoe polish, or even condensed milk. And for a paintbrush, he would actually use tufts of his own hair attached to twigs that he would find. This ingenuity allowed him a certain freedom throughout his internment. After close to four months, Shamas was released and began to serve in the civil defense service as a fire guard. It was during this voluntary service that he was able to see the destruction of the Blitz bombings up close and personal. Some of his most powerful emotive pieces are depictions of this destruction and again, manipulating the accessible materials to express himself. Shamas used the rubble or the urban detritus created from the aftermath of the bombings to create mosaics, which depicted the broken world he witnessed around him. While you all take a moment to, to take in this extremely powerful mosaic uh, entitled Return to the Fatherland in 1944, I can say Shamus never lived in Germany again, and he never saw his mother or sister again. They were both deported in the summer of 1942, and today there are two brass stones laid in their memory outside the family home. Shamas left England in 1949 and arrived in New York and later became naturalized in 1945. It's my understanding that Shamas led a completely different life in New York, I believe in part because he saw it as a new beginning. This was an entirely new chapter in his journey of emigration, immigration, and exile. In August of 1964, he wrote that since arriving in the States, he has had four one-man shows in New York, one in Philadelphia and one in Washington, one at the Bezalel Museum in Jerusalem and a co-exhibit with Marcel Bernheim in Paris. He wrote of the stark contrast between his experiences in London and that of New York. For one, the common experience and solidarity that those in wartime at London felt. These mosaics and their corresponding proposal sketches that you see were submissions to a 1956 exhibit held at the Jewish Theological Seminary entitled contemporary art for synagogues and homes. Here we see two traditional Jewish themes, the left, behind, the left being the lighting of the Hanukkah candles and on the right, the blowing of the shofar, symbolizing the new year, Rosh Hashanah. With these mosaics, Shamus returns to a medium he used during the war, but this time he broke the glass himself where the vibrant colors and the transparency gives the ability for an entirely different effect when they're beautifully illuminated from behind. With that, I'm going to pass the mic back to Dr. Vistrovich for, for more historical background. Okay, thank you very much. And so, as Annika Friedman really wonderfully explained, art cannot be viewed separately from the social conditions under which it was created. The interrelationship of artworks and society plays out between aesthetic traditions, contemporary culture, industries, political power relations. Economic conditions of artists, the private environment and the perception and reception of their works by the public also play an important role. Artists depend on the art market, their audiences, and public tastes. All of this changed tremendously when artists were forced into exile. In addition, many artists had to leave behind their artworks. Either they were confiscated, or they were way too big or too heavy, or in some other ways not in a condition that they could be traveling with them. For some artists, this experience was so harsh that they never ever touched any kind of artistic materials again. Those who continued to work as an artist faced tremendous challenges. Not only had they the hurdle of being acknowledged as an artist in exile, they also had to face completely new linguistic, political, cultural, economic, private, and intellectual environments that they were not accustomed to. Moreover, besides the materialistic hardships that they experienced. Many of them experienced another thing that 
was also quite blocking when it comes to creativity. They experienced loneliness and the feeling of being detached from their surroundings. The UK were one of those countries that were really first off um, an ideal place for many refugees. 10 to 15% of all refugees from the Germany and Austria went to the UK, but only 8,000 of them chose to emigrate to the United Kingdom until 1938. Numbers only started to surge after 1938. By September 1939, approximately 55,000 refugees lived in the United Kingdom. Among those were 90% either of Jewish origin or politically persecuted. But then in 1939, with the beginning of the Second World War, immigration came to a standstill. Visas lost their validity and only refugees from neutral considered countries were able to emigrate to the United Kingdom. And even then, they needed to have at least one relative already living there and the assurance that they won't be considered as a threat to the society. Nonetheless, artists are usually not those or usually you aren't an artist if you are not able to voice your opinions. So even in exile, many of them fought their own fight against Hitler. I just show three of those examples. We can talk about them later in more detail, but nonetheless, as a reaction and counter exhibit for the degenerate art exhibit, the Artists Association had an exhibit in London called Exhibition of German 20th Century Art. The original title was planned to be Band Art. And all in all, it was one of the first real widely received reactions that put the Nazi culture policy into an international represented and often recognized press and also highlighted the whole situation of artists living in exile in the United Kingdom. Another thing that happened was the Freier Deutscher Kulturbund, the Free German Cultural Association, which was funded in Britain by refugees. It was funded in 1939 and it was also one of those places where artists and writers and scientists found their own way of communicating amongst each other, each other and finding ways out of loneliness, at the same time voicing their opinions and having a platform where they can at least be creative. The same applies to the opening of the Modern Art Gallery, which was founded by Jack Bilbo, born Hugo Baruch, who was a refugee himself and who opened this gallery when he returned from internment. Something that already came up in Annika's presentation was the situation that many, not to say almost all enemy aliens had to face in Great Britain, this, the time of internment. In 1939, immediately after the war started, it was discussed whether enemy aliens should be detained or repatriated to Germany. Since most of those people who would be affected by this decision were refugees who fled from Germany, it was clear that they cannot be returned. Still, the discussion continued. In contrast to France, where immediately after the war broke out, internment started, it almost took one year until the first people were interned. But immediately in 1939, tribunals took place to at least screen and categorize enemy aliens, even if they are not interned immediately. There were three categories. One, security risk. B, trustworthy with conditions. C, opposed to Hitler and law 
right to the United Kingdom. A total of 73,000 persons were screened. 55,000 of those were refugees. I can also later on go into more detail when it comes to the internment phase. But all in all, all of those people were sooner or later interned when it came to the decisions in 1940. The first step was that all Germans and Austrian citizens who were male and between 16 and 60 around the coastal area were interned. Later on, all men of the category B, then all women of the category B. In the fourth step, the legal age was increased to 70 years. In the fifth step, German, Austrian and Czechs who lived in the UK for less than 20 years. And in the sixth step, a general roundup took place. All people from the category C, which were the remaining 13 person, 13,000 person, were round up in June 1940. In the beginning, the press really favored the situation and thus also the public opinion was in favor of the internment. At the beginning in summer 1940, 55% of the British people were totally um, agreeing with this whole situation. At the end of summer 1940, only 35% were still in agreeing with internment of enemy aliens. What, hap what had happened in between? It was obvious for many who read the press and also who were at least acquainted with some of those enemy aliens, how the living conditions in the internment camps were completely unsatisfying. Also, a lot of school children 16, 17 years of age, who were housed by foster parents in London or other parts of Great Britain, were interned. And last but not least, many of them who were refugees were interned together with people who were openly or who were openly sympathizing with Nazi ideologies. After the internment, many of them still remained in Great Britain. But as also was clear with Samson Chalmers, there was another place of exile for many European refugees who was really prioritized when it came to applying for visa, and that was the United States. Unfortunately, the annual quota for Germany was way too low. It was 30,000, and in most years, it wasn't even exhausted. In 1938, 1939, more than 248 names were on the waiting list for US consulates in Germany. That was half of the Jewish population at that time. All in all, 130,000 German refugees were admitted to the US between 1933 and 1945. Out of them, 70,000 German-speaking immigrants decided to live in New York, where they hoped for a better living environment, as many of them settled and places like Washington Heights became quite closely resembling something that could be called home. But at the same time, the living conditions for artists were harsh. They faced a lot of com um, competition, they had to deal with the fact that nobody really knew their names. And in many cases, those who started to really feel at home in Great Britain, suddenly had to face a situation that they had to start from scratch again. So the, while the exile in the United States was considered an opportunity for many, at the same time, it was for others, the last remaining start, and they decided to take it, even though they might be facing oblivion when it comes to their future as an artist. <laughs>
Thank you to both Miriam and Annika for this uh, broad look, both at the general uh, exile and specifically of uh, Shamus. Um, I'm gonna ask a few questions and again, please put your questions in the Q&A and we'll get to them very soon. But um, Annika, I know you've only been at this for a few months, but I'm so curious about um, what you might know about um, Shamus's personality and how much of this resilience that he demonstrated was um, a part of him, how much of it was luck and circumstance. Um, obviously, there are people, there are artists that did not get out. There are artists that stopped work. What what is it about Shamus that we know um, that uh, allowed him to or forced him to continue to create? So although I've only been at this for a little while, I feel as though I'm getting to know him a little bit through, through the resources that I have. I think every, every situation of exile and every situation of, of a refugee um, is very, very different and unique. But from what, I, what I've researched is some of it can come down to luck, sure, but a large part, a large portion, I, I, we must give credit to the individual himself he used his surroundings, he used his network, he used um, all the contacts that he had uh, professionally within his family here in Frankfurt. He already set up his, his line to, to the Netherlands. He was go going to London. He had a cousin in London, more distant cousin, but I think this tenacity and this will to, to want to use everything that he had available to him Again, we can speak artistically, but also personally, he had such a desire, he knew what was going on and he had such a desire to leave and he used his entire network to make that, to make that happen. Great, I think, no, that's, yeah. that's a really good answer. Um, does raise a, something that, you know, I wouldn't wanna, this is not to say anything um, negative about Shamus, but the things you describe come from status and education. And um, I don't know if more largely Miriam, and, and, and I did not give her this question in advance that so she may not have actual data, but I mean, this is, this is something that uh, people have looked at, right? That uh, we know that nearly uh, or half the uh, German Jewish population got out, um, but were there uh, differences, of course, uh, by who had networks, who had relatives, who had who had means. Mm. So your question, if I understood it correctly, is about who had the networks. Most of those who really got out early on had networks. Later on, it was almost impossible to leave the country without having enough financial resources ready because those who left early on could take almost all of their belongings with them. So they had the opportunity and possibility to settle in early on. For example, when it came to exile in the United States, there were some people who already got out and went into exile in the United States in 1933, but those were just a fraction. Most artists were really not leaving Europe until it was almost too late. Mm -hmm. Well, and then maybe we should compare the, the arts to other things. We know there were special efforts to bring academics, for example, to the United States. And I do think that artists um, were known and and that's how some of those networks developed and also through the Kulturbund, which you spoke about. But um, maybe, I mean, it was a very large organization of musicians and, um, and, pro and was well known. So what, uh, what role did that or other cultural institutions play in helping artists? Well, first of all, there was the American Joint Distribution Committee, which was originally just installed in 1914 in order to support Jews after the First World War. And then when the situation shifted after 1933, increasingly supported German Jews in their efforts to get out, even paying for the visa paying for any kind of official documents that they might be needing. And at the same time, like you mentioned, the Kulturbund, almost all 
countries of exile had their own German cultural association, a um, guilt for German cultural freedom, or however the culture was translated into the language. For example, in America, there was an American guilt for German cultural freedom, which was funded in 1935 in England by a refugee from Germany. And the same applies to the Kulturbund in London, and the same applies to many other countries that also had some kind of similar institution that was funded by the refugees, like the original German Kulturbund, which was already funded in 1933. In order to get all of those artists that were not only or no longer in any kind of civil service to get them out and in order to at least support them financially and provide them with the opportunity to show their art or their performances. Mm -hmm. That's great. And, and uh, Annika, I don't know if you have anything to comment on the fact that, I mean, there are different forms of art. So with the Kulturbund, we're more or less, we're thinking a lot about musicians, but uh, Samson obviously was a, was a, a creator of, of painting and other forms of, of individual artwork. So there is the, the individual artist versus the group artist. And I don't know if, uh, you know, if at the museum, it's much more dedicated to those individual artists, but um, is there any thought about the, the difference between the kinds of art and uh, exile? I definitely think that the, there is a there is a clear distinction between the different forms of art and the different media that the that an artist will, will use, and that definitely affects how he or she can continue in exile, continue or, or possibly not be able to continue with their with their art form. Um, thinking about this, I I have to go back to this to the idea that it's in rather than the particular media and the particular art form, it's really much more contingent on the individual themselves and the circumstances in which they go into exile. And Dr. Bistrovich spoke about this in, in wonderful detail, how old is, how old is said artist? Um, the, I mean, male, female, these are, these are all, obviously the, the time they went into exile at the beginning of the war after, I mean, at the turn of the war, like Dr. Bistrovitz said, it was it was nearly impossible. Um, but when when referring to Shamas, we see there's there's already an ability to adapt. He his life course had changed so many different times. He had dappled in in so many different art forms that although he stayed within the visual arts, you saw that his career. His career changed multiple times and he started leaning more towards his this applied art form that he learned and you know stage designs even textile these are all very different media mediums so mm -hmm. i think that um although he stayed in the visual arts you see within the you know the timeline of shamus himself how he was able to to really adapt and mold himself to the situation as it presented itself Great, thank you. We're gonna to turn to some questions from the audience that David Brown is going to uh, read. And um, just before, I, I wanna say one more thing. Uh, earlier we mentioned our uh, online exhibit that was a physical exhibit at the Leon Beck Institute, but you can check out online uh, about the art of exile. And we chose works from uh, a dozen artists who painted all over the world to their places of exile. But our last painting is a blank frame. And I just want us to remember that there were artists that um, no longer could create because they did not get out and were murdered, or maybe they got out in circumstances present, prevented them from continuing to do their work, both uh, physical, um, economic, and perhaps uh, psychological. So uh, that, that goes along with some of the inner resilience, but also some of the luck. Um, David, please. Yeah, so I'll start with a question from Carrie Wallach. Can you talk more about the Freier Künstlerbund and what they were able to accomplish in London circa 1938. I know this group was active in Paris as well, especially in organizing the Freie Deutsche Kunst exhibition in November 1938 in Paris. And I'm curious to know whether there was collaboration between the two centers in London and Paris. Um, 
And then there's a second part to this question. Uh, Carrie writes, I'm also interested in thinking about this group as a form of resistance. Was this the ideal form of resistance for artists since it allowed them to show their banned works? Who would like to take that on? First about the Freier, the Freier Künstlerbund in London um, and whether they worked together with um, the uh, parallel group in, in Paris. Well, I assume since I brought it up, I should be answering it. <laughs> So, like I already mentioned, the culture bonds were always, or not always, but mostly connected to the country they originated in. So, for example, the Freie Deutsche Kulturbund in London was interested in what is happening in France, but they were not really cooperating, mostly because they just didn't have the financial means and just didn't know how to do it in an efficient way. Since in 1939, there was no opportunity to collaborate in exchanging artworks, for example. You cannot transport any kind of artwork between countries that are already on the verge of war or ineffective in a war state. But most of those artists really found that their work and especially their work in exhibiting and writing and performing was some kind of resistance and some kind of fight against Hitler. So what was shown in my presentation was a quote from Jack Bilbo, who really opened up his, his modern art gallery in 1941, when already most of those other artworks were already stored way out of London in order to save them from the Blitz. But at the same time, he was of the opinion that it has to open up now in order to really have some kind of oasis and platform where artists can still discuss openly and have their art viewed in freedom and also show that they are not in any way just backing down from Hitler's persecution. Uh, thanks, Miriam. Um, so now let's turn to um, Shamus's time in New York, and we have a question from Monroe Price that gets to that. Um, Monroe writes, in Germany, it seemed that Shamus was connected to movements and developments, but you seem to suggest that in New York he wasn't. Did he hang out with refugees or exiles in New York? Um, and would you classify him as a refugee more than as an exile? It's an interesting distinction. Um, and then uh, Monroe goes on later to say, uh, to ask in particular, whether the Aufbau ever covered um, Samson Shamus and how they covered refugee artists in general. Um, Annika, are you at, at your point of your research that you could uh, answer that? I'm not sure I can speak to his, the entirety of his of the years of his life he spent in New York. Uh, I have come across a source, though, that says that he was incredibly lonely uh, in New York, even though it was an incredibly bustling city. At the beginning, he found it extremely overwhelming, um, and he couldn't necessarily connect uh, to other artists very quickly. Um, I read though later that he was actually able to connect with artists when he and his wife uh, Edith would go um, to, uh, to a summer home to their, to their location where they would spend their summer vacations. He was able to connect with, with fellow artists there um, putting, putting on shows together and he was also able to sell some of his art that he made uh, during the, his New York time. Um, so he, this source says that he actually found much more success uh, during his summer holidays outside of New York. Yeah, but it, there's certainly a lot of evidence that, I mean, I, I don't know about the summer homes, but there are a lot of relationships with fellow um, uh, German Jews, and I don't know whether you want to call them exiles or refugees. And another piece of evidence of, of his relationship to the German Jewish community is he designed the stained glass windows for the German Jewish um, uh, synagogue Habonim, 
Um, so I'm, I'm sure he was, as with most refugees, the, the, the first place to go was with that, with their, with their uh, fellow country men and women. David? Yeah, thank you, um, Annika and Billy. N next, we have a question from anonymous attendee um, who uh, asks about a different period in Shamus's life, and that is Germany in the 20s and 30s. So I guess before the Nazi era and before his emigration. Um, uh, they write, I believe Shamus was very active in the dynamic at artistic atmosphere in Germany at this time. Could you share with us some of what Shamus was doing? And a, another person further up writes that um, Shamus designed, and that's this is Raoul Goldschmidt, Shamus designed and painted the sets for the first presentation of Alban Bears, Berg's opera Wozzeck. Um, and and uh, Raoul asks whether Shamus was involved in later stage designs. Is that something you can speak to, Annika? I, I do know that he was very much at the height of his career when he was when he was ripped out of his uh, surroundings here here in Germany. I know that he was he was very successful here here in Frankfurt and very involved in different circles um, of artists and he and he was really he was very much on on the up. Um, I do I do not believe that he continued with uh, uh, with set design. Um, I would welcome if, if somebody if somebody knows otherwise. Um, but no, I, I do not believe that he con continued with set designs. But the skills and and the mentality and this applied art that education followed him, and was very much a, a large part of uh, his successful mosaics. And those are also skills that he he brought with him uh, into the into stained glass windows as well. Thanks. Um... Let's turn to a question from Sybil Ruth, who asks um, whether you can say more about the work done by Shamus at Huyten. Um, is it held by the Walker Gallery in Liverpool? Um, and Sybil notes that her grandfather was also interned at Huyten, so she's very interested in the situation of the internees there. I know that LBI has one watercolor that was done at Huyten, but um, I'm not sure about the location of the rest of those works. Could, can you speak to that? I know that a lot of um, it's it's a it's a guessing game a lot of the time, and it's also a large part of my my research, which will continue now into the next year and a half. I know that uh, his the works from his Frankfurt time are extremely rare. Uh, a lot of the works from the internment camp are also quite rare, um, and so it, it is a bit of a it's a bit of a search still. But the three that I showed you were from the Jewish Museum of Frankfurt from the collection here. Um, also, very they they all use mixed media, um, as I as I said, you know, he used his rations to paint those. Um, so I don't I don't feel comfortable speaking to the entirety the entire art scene at the at the Heiden camp, but I do know that um, that that Shamus definitely um, produced produced multiple pieces of work and, and some of which um, some of which have, have survived the, the test of time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say, as I said at the beginning, and I know there are uh, people that came on late that were very interested in what other people's experiences are, if they, if they knew Shamus or if their families knew Shamus, uh, and also if they have uh, access to or know of works, because I think that would be the one thing that would, that, that all of the artists that were suffered these consequences. One thing they would have in common is uh, a change in um, materials that they used, uh, a loss of works that they created, uh, and, uh, and a great deal of mystery. So um, we are interested in what people know about that uh, very much. And so both. Um, for uh, the exhibit that Annika is preparing at the uh, Jewish Museum of Frankfurt and for our own studies and the possibility of uh, incorporating um, those incredible mosaics <clears throat> into an exhibit. Yes, and um, Billy, I just wanna note that your email is in the chat 
So for anyone who is in attendance and would like to share with us anything you, um, anything you know about Shamus or his work or um, you know, personal connections you may have to him, um, we are uh, interested in filling in some of the blanks. So um, you can write to Billy. Um, in, again, his email address is in the chat. And um, Billy, that's a good segue to just reading a few of the comments that are coming in um, from people who did know Shamus who are on the call. And it seems like there are quite a few. Um, for instance, Yvonne just wrote, he had family in New York. Um, he lived on Austin Street in Queens and had a fascinating atelier. He also had a good sense of humor. My mother was his first cousin. Unfortunately, he had a bad heart, which limited his activity, but never kept him from creating new art. Um, we've also heard from Natalie Green Giles, um, who notes uh, that there are multiple descendants of Shamus, both from his mother's side um, and his father's side. Um, she writes, my mother is the granddaughter of Martha Shamus, Fritz's first cousin, and she grew up in Kew Gardens, New York, with close contact with Fritz and his wife, Edith, after they arrived in NYC. Several others here, some of whom have memories they could possibly share. Edith lived a very long life, so we all knew her very well, even the third generation. That's, that's great, and I, I really hope that uh, both of those people and others will uh, send me an email. We also may have your email from your registration for this event, and we will follow up, uh, because as you can tell with Annika in Frankfurt and ourselves here in New York, uh, we continue to uh, investigate. And, um, and again, um, I don't want us to lose the, the larger picture here. Uh, both uh, what we tried to express in The Art of Exile and what the theme of Carnegie Hall's Voices of Hope is uh, about the, the human spirit. Um, this is not just about art. I mean, in many other ways, individuals who survived who weren't artists uh, exemplified this resilience, but perhaps it's artists who can best uh, demonstrate it and, it and communicate it in their, in their medium. Um, so it's very exciting to think about Shamus and other artists who um, were uh, both, as Annika says, lucky and resilient and um, created uh, art that uh, communicates the um, exile experience. Uh, David, we have time for another question, if there are any. Um, or I I, will... Yeah, sure. Just one more question. And this is one that came in early and it's, it's very uh, thought provoking. Um, it comes from Jennifer Malvin, um, who writes, because artists are gifted with great imagination, do you think that they were more able to imagine that the Holocaust was possible and so were more likely to flee? Um, <laughs> Miriam, do you want to give that one a try first? Well, I would have to speculate, but uh, there's a quote from Heinrich Heinrich, who wrote that wherever one starts to burn books, human people will follow. So in a way, it might be that artists who are not only creative, but also sensitive to their surroundings in order to create art, felt it quite early on that their artworks were no longer acceptable. And in many ways, whatever was written about them was already in such harsh words that it was clear to them that they cannot sustain this themselves anymore in Germany when they want to stay as an artist. So, like I said, many of them tried to go into exile in Europe in hopes of just staying away until this whole nightmare will end. And then they were round up after the war started and were no longer in any kind of situation that they could flee. But some of them already started looking outside of Europe and hoped that they might be finding some kind of refuge in the United Kingdom, or which is part of Europe, yes, but also already a little bit more distant than, for example, France or Czechoslovakia. And others were already planning to go into the United States because there they hoped to have similar living conditions or at least a similar art market that they knew from Europe. In, in contrast to, for example, going into East Asia, 
where they really had to face a, an environment that was so alien to many of them that they couldn't even expect to work as an artist anymore. So I hope that answers the question in part. I can think of a couple of his, uh, forces. One would be that, as Miriam well documented, artists were one of the early people that were, or professions that were targeted in, in, in a very public way. So yeah, maybe that made them aware. But on the other hand, um, artists come out of their milieu and um, to change that milieu is a big challenge. So that might've been a countervailing force. Um, I really wanna thank um, Miriam and Annika uh, for their wonderful presentations and answering some very difficult questions that um, uh, and, and doing them in, in a very uh, fine way. Uh, thanks to David also for uh, bringing questions from the audience. Thanks to the audience for staying with us. A reminder uh, to look up our Art of Exile uh, exhibit that is online to watch for and come to Frankfurt uh, in um, 2022 for the exhibit about Shamas. Uh, contact me uh, with information about Shamas. Um, and uh, if last but not least, although it's not just about art, please check out the Leo Beck Institute's Shared History Project, which is our big project of the year, which includes artists, but all other uh, uh, types of people. It tells about the shared history between Jews and individuals and communities in German speaking lands for the last 1,700 years. So it's a rather ambitious project, but we'd love for you to check it out. And the link for that is online. Uh, is uh, listed in the chat. Um, thanks to everyone again, and um, we hope to see you again at uh, future events.